Hi everybody, uh, I'm back. Uh, this time I'm, I'm back home and sitting in a more comfortable den than uh, being at LMU. Um, it was quite an afternoon. I uh, taped it and then found out that the file, which was over four gigs of the first uh, lecture, uh, was too large to upload to Brightspace. So then I spent an hour on the phone with uh, information services and they told me to just compress it into a zip file and then try that but that was also too big so that was the end of trying to upload directly to brightspace so then i realized i needed a a third party uh hosting video hosting uh platform so i uh opened up an account uh on vimeo and then i tried to upload to vimeo but it said that uh, uh, I needed to um, pay for, you know, being a, a Vimeo member, that it was too big for being a free member. So I, I, I decided I wasn't going to do that either. So I do have a, uh, a channel on YouTube that I started for a different class. And uh, fortunately, the third time was a charm and the YouTube video... Um, uh, worked, and I was able to uh, transfer the uh, the file. So now, now I have the platform. I'm going to record the second half of the uh, adolescent lecture, which is on social emotional development, and um, and then when I'm done with that, I'm going to tape uh, some preparation for the quiz on Tuesday, and then the um, second exam on the Tuesday after that, and then we should be uh, in pretty good shape. Okay, so so this, um, this lecture's on social-emotional development in, uh, in adolescence, and the first person, and you know, again, go back to the slide, the last two slides uh, in the adolescent slide deck will pertain to social-emotional development, and my comments are going to be just amplifying and clarifying what's uh, on, the, uh, on the slide deck. So anyway, on the first slide, um, it says that the original model of um, adolescence was um, social emotional development was put forth by a guy named G. Stanley Hall in 1904. So about uh, 115 years or so ago. Um, was the first real position paper on adolescent social emotional development by G. Stanley Hall, who was a professor at Clark University uh, outside of uh, Boston. Um, G. Stanley Hall is um, well known in psychology, not just because uh, of being the first person to talk about adolescent social emotional development, but because he was the only person who successfully uh, invited and got Sigmund Freud to come to the United States um, and give some introductory lectures uh, on psychoanalysis. The only time Freud ever came to the United States was at G. Stanley Hall's invitation. And the reason I think that Freud came was because G. Stanley Hall's conception of adolescent a social emotional development was very much in line with that of Freud. Um, Freud felt that it was going to be um, a, a difficult uh, stage and G. Stanley Hall uh, also agreed with that. In fact, he coined the phrase that adolescence is necessarily a stage of storm and stress. So what I want to do is to go through the perspectives on adolescent social emotional development that have occurred since the early 1900s when Hall started the field and to see if the uh, theories that, and the perspectives that came after his initial conception supported his viewpoint of adolescence being a period of storm or stress storm and stress, or whether or not it modulated or changed that perspective. All right, 
So if you go to the next slide, I've uh, summarized on the uh, chart the perspectives um, on um, that have come after uh, G. Stanley Hall and whether or not there these models uh, supported the storm and stress uh, perspective or qualified or modulated it to a degree or models that outright opposed it. All right. So I'm going to start off in the left column and talk a little bit about the models that support the storm and stress uh, concept. And the first one uh, is Freud's psychobiological model. Uh, Freud believed that there was going to be inherent uh, tension and conflict in uh, the lives of individuals in modern society because um, in order for culture to exist, it has to limit the free expression of biologically based drives of aggression and sexuality. So you can imagine a society that was completely lawless and had no constraints on uh, aggression. It would be like the Purge movie 365 days of the year, you can't have a society. So society has to limit anger, has to limit rage, has to limit aggression, or else it cannot continue. Also, the society has to limit the free expression of sexuality. In particular, what it has to do is limit sexuality um, and reproduction among genetically similar individuals. Um, and consistent with that, every society in the history of human culture has had some form of incest taboo, that it is always <clears throat> culturally unacceptable for individuals who are biologically, genetically related to each other, especially members of a nuclear family or close relatives, the society has always tried to inhibit sexual expression um, among genetically similar individuals. The reason, if you ask most people, they'll say because it's immoral, you know, and, and in fact it is um, uh, immoral in, in societies, but the immorality came after the societies realized that sexuality and specifically reproduction among people who are genetically similar um, is a danger to the perpetuation of the society. It's dangerous in several ways. First of all, when you have reproduction among uh, individuals who are genetically related, the incidence of mental retardation or cognitive deficits is much, much higher. Think of, think of um, a purebred um, um, dog, for example, as opposed to a mutt. There are many more purebreds who may look beautiful, but they are not that intelligent, whereas some mangy mutt, who is the product of a, a diverse uh, uh, genetic background, um, are oftentimes much smarter. And this is for human beings, too. If you if people who are genetically similar reproduce, you have a much higher incidence of mental retardation and cognitive deficit. And therefore, if this happens a lot, you have a society that is perpetually a dumber and less adaptive to circumstances, and it threatens the operation of culture. Not only does, um, uh, does it work on the cognitive level, but reproduction among genetically similar people often produces you know, um, uh, lethal diseases. For example, one notable one is hemophilia, where people cannot coagulate blood and they'll bleed out in the, with the slightest cut. So that is a, a lethal disease. And Freud saw when he was the therapist to the Habsburg Empire um, in, um, in Austria, where he lived in Vienna, he saw that there was a lot going on in that uh, castle that was inappropriate. A lot of 
uh, incest, a lot of inbreeding, and there were many people in the in the um, Habsburg uh, monarchy that came down with hemophilia, and he saw firsthand what could happen with the free expression of sexuality. And then finally, and perhaps most importantly, is that if you allow sexuality uh, within kinship networks, and especially close kinship networks, what happens is that individuals uh, have a less diverse gene pool. And the uh, more restricted the gene pool, the less diverse the gene pool, the more subject as it is to being wiped out by a single virus or bacteria. We saw in uh, the bubonic plague uh, in Europe, uh, Freud studied this and saw that a single um, disease almost you know, wiped out a European culture. So the great protection is by, by having people forced to reproduce with people who are not like them, that you get more and more diversity in the gene pool. And there are always people who are not susceptible to a particular virus or disease and will survive and perpetuate culture um, and, and uh, keep things going. Whereas if everyone was the same, you had a danger of the culture being wiped out. So this is what Freud meant by civilization must oppose the biological, the animalistic nature of human beings in order for culture to be perpetuated. And one of the ways it does that is it prohibits sex within families and, and, and kinship networks. So in terms of adolescence, bringing this to adolescence, the adolescent has, you know, goes through uh, puberty and there's this incredible increase in sex specific hormones that we talked about in the last um, lecture. And so the, the sexual nature of the young person explodes in a, in a rush of desire. And um, the, but the problem is that there's all of this sexuality, but it cannot be expressed in the family. And to Freud, this is a big part of the tension in families that the family is trying to grapple with the sexual nature of the child, even though it cannot be expressed in the family. Now, this may seem old fashioned to you. When Freud was writing in the Victor Victorian era, it was a very big deal. Now we have much more free expression uh, of sexuality, but still the prohibition of sexual expression in families and the tension that that can create is still real in our society. And so the offspring has to go against the parents and has to leave the parents and, and has to leave the family to some degree in order to have a full sexual future. And that tension about how the family deals with the emergent sexuality of, of adolescence to Freud, who is a psychobiologist, you know, was the critical ingredient for why adolescents would have tensions and be on, on edge a lot. It was all about um, sexual frustration and sexual um, conflicts that were in the family. All right, so this may be a somewhat archaic view, you know, in our society. Um, and although issues of the parents and children grappling with the emergent sexuality of their offspring in early adolescence um, is sometimes still an issue. So there's still some relevance there. Now, this brings us to uh, Erickson, who is also a 